I, hmm? Solutions. Yeah. I, I think we find ourselves at a crossroads. There's one way to turn this around, maybe. I'd call the Swedish model. There's not much you can say for the Swedish model um, that's encouraging. Um, if you've got a country or a region of the world that is losing population, that's devastating. I mean, that would say that that region would be in a depression, we'd call it in, in, in economics. My experience in talking to people about this is that they simply don't, don't understand what's about to happen. There's not much quibble. There's not much controversy among people in the know. We have entered into a new phase of modern history. One that we desperately need to understand. You know, there's been a great decline in maybe 70 countries now that are below replacement fertility. Replacement fertility is the number of childbirths per woman that is required to replace the existing population. We're going into a new era. Why is, it, is this aging and why is this uh, demographic winter occurring? It's happening in rich countries, it's happening in poor countries, it's happening in Catholic countries, Islamic countries, and that is everywhere um, people are having fewer and fewer children. When fewer children are born, there are proportionately more elderly. This is called an aging population. The world for the last 200 years has been population increases pretty much in all countries. So that's the challenge, to try to first understand why it's happening and then some consequences. The reason the world has experienced a population explosion over the past century is not because human beings suddenly started breeding like rabbits, it's because they finally stopped dying like flies. What's really driven up human numbers has been a health explosion. The population of children in the world has already declined, um, and yet world population will probably grow by another 1.7, 1.8 billion. It's a paradoxical reality until you do the simple arithmetic to see what's happening to the population of different age groups. Certain population reduction in at least some countries, and in many countries without immigration, uh, enters us into unknown terrain where there are potentially very significant negative consequences. Subreplacement fertility a generation and more ago means that the working age population, age 15 to 64, is going to be slowing and then peaking and then declining more or less indefinitely as far as the demographer's eye can see. In previous eras in which we had manpower shortages, we resorted to things like slavery and indentured servitude. And gradually, as the world population took off, uh, beginning in the 18th century, we, we freed more and more categories of people from slavery, from debt peonage. Most people think, because they've seen it all their life, real estate only goes up, they're not making more of it, population's growing, and real estate doesn't always go up. It was down a lot of the early 1900s, and particularly in the 1930s in that depression. Northern Italy and parts of Spain, with fertility rates below one, homes 
in abandoned villages all around Europe. First, there's a few births. Fertility rate is very low. It's 1.38 in Europe, uh, whereas the rate needed for survival is 2.1. While Western Europe is experiencing low fertility, parts of Eastern Europe are already experiencing population decline. From 1989, uh, for example, to 2002, uh, the population has decreased by 13%. The United States will face severe problems even before population itself may begin to decline. Imagine if all your taxes went for nothing but Social Security and Medicare, and you still didn't have health care as a young person. <laughs> all right, so we face real challenges here. Low fertility levels, which is the main cause of declining populations, means we don't have so many people in working ages compared to those who are retired and collecting retirement and other benefits. How are we going to finance it in the future? It's also true that um, never in history have we had economic prosperity accompanied by depopulation. Modern economies need growing populations, which means that every developed nation needs immigration. Developed countries would say that they, there's no problem with aging because they can make up the lack of labor force by immigration, which is happening today, especially in Europe, Australia. This will mean greater out-migration from the poor countries. This out-migration is basically young, it's basically male. And that is uh, very serious for several reasons, but I mean the two that I like to point out is one is the labor productivity is decreased in the developing country because there's no labor force they are overseas. And second, the generation of human capital because those children are growing up without a father. Well, human capital refers to the knowledge, skills, information that people have. Modern economies are based on information and knowledge, uh, not physical strength, but a command, mental command of different types of information and skills. So it, it's the foundation of modern economies. Any economy that doesn't have substantial investments in its people's human capital won't be able to become a, mo a modern or a rich economy. It would be ironic and it would be very unjust that the poor countries should come out to bail out the rich countries because the rich countries have been delinquent in doing their homework to keeping up stable and strong families and then they themselves would lose theirs, bailing us out. This chapter is about um, the American family and why it is that, um, that the United States is having enough children to replace itself, more or less. I think many people would say it's Hispanic immigrants that are, are having uh, children fairly early, um, having two or three when Greece and Spain and France and Italy and um, Japan and Russia, all of Eastern Europe, have fertility that's much below replacement. Mexico has experienced an incredible birth dearth. The decline in, in fertility in Mexico is without precedent in world history. Americans have this vision that there'll always be Mexicans trying to come across the border <laughs> and that we need some huge wall to keep them out. Well, careful what you wish for, because not only in Mexico, but throughout Latin America, we're seeing these dramatic declines in fertility. 60% of U.S. population growth since 1990 has come from immigrants and their children, mostly Hispanic immigrants. Adam Smith, probably the greatest of all economists, once wrote that prosperity is associated with growing populations and depression he didn't quite use that word, but he meant that is associated with declining population. It's new, it could lead to very serious other negative consequences. These are a few that I mentioned. 
Before we go further into the consequences of demographic winter, let us first explore the causes. How did we get here? Why did fertility decline so much? I mean, that's the $64,000 question, as we say. Uh, I wouldn't say we know a whole reason by a long shot, but we, I think we know uh, and, and evidence suggests some of the very important reasons. W one is the growing value of the time of mothers, working mothers, educated mothers. The more successful women become in the workplace before they have their children, the higher the opportunity costs when they have their kids. So it's harder to leave work. So they, they don't want to spend as much time having children as um, participating in the labor force and doing other things. That's clearly been important. Well, the causes, you can see how the, some of the causes are very closely related to the economy, and those are not necessarily bad factors, like the growing education of women, very good. Women now have higher education than men in the United States. Many more women are enrolled in college than, than men, so that's one consequence. A second very important factor, richer countries have more money to spend, but they also have greater aspirations because they're in richer economies. Uh, they want to spend more on themselves, uh, adults, and they want to spend more on their children. Affluence doesn't just mean that we buy more stuff. It means that we also want to live our lives as individuals as opposed to being uh, in large groups. So what they do is they have fewer children and invest more in each child. When you look at all of the social science data, there seems to be one predictor that explains fertility levels better than any other, and that is desired family size, as expressed by women who are so surveyed. Economists tell us that as countries and individuals become prosperous, they tend to desire fewer children. I think the sexual revolution is the most profound event of the 20th century, quite honestly. It may even be the most profound event of modern history. There definitely was a sexual revolution, and you can see it very clearly in women's reports of their lives. If you talk to women who, who came of age in 1960 and later, a much higher proportion will have been sexually active before marriage with somebody they did not marry. There's no denying that uh, once we began to the, the, the travel down the road toward gender equality and all the other changes associated with it, including birth control, everything changed. Women who came of age after about 1960 have more partners, are more likely to divorce, more likely to have worked than um, women who came of age in the 40s, the 30s, 40s, or 50s. Behavior changed, the world changed in ways that affected the choices people made about sex and marriage and childbearing and work. And uh, most notably, I believe, the family changed. For multiple reasons, social scientists believe that the sexual revolution had both direct and indirect effects on fertility decline. The one thing that's least discussed in our nation uh, is the rising rate of cohabitation, non-marital cohabitation. Cohabiting couples tend to have fewer children than married couples, so, and it also pushes the age of marriage up and up, and one of the biggest reasons for the low fertility is people have children too late. There's some research that suggests that the change to no-fault divorce led to an increase in the divorce rate of something like 20%. The divorce revolution has really meant that neither men nor women can count on their spouse being there next year. The risk of divorce that a, a couple faces decreases the chances they'll have another child. One final cause. Various assumptions had huge impacts on the number of children that were desired. We will look at one of those. I think it's quite natural for people who live on a planet whose dimensions are fixed 
to have impressed upon their consciousness or their consciousness the idea that uh, we live in a world with real limits. I can understand why the ordinary man in the street would be a little bit wary about grandiose population predictions. After all, the last thing I ever heard from demographers was we were on the, the throes of this population bomb. Human numbers on the planet in the 20th century almost quadrupled, we think. And over this same period of time, the international inflation-adjusted price of rice and wheat and corn dropped by about 70 percent. The population bomb was popularized by non-demographers and by the press back in the 70s, and real demographers, even back then, knew this world was coming that I'm talking about. As a society, we don't like to talk about the causes of fertility decline. We don't want to possibly offend other people. The really chilling thing about demographic winter is that none of these causes could be easily fixed. It's who we are, who we have become increasingly in these postmodern times. We came up in 1988 with an extremely simple indicator. I found it because I had the S&P 500 long term on, on one side of my desk and the birth chart for the baby boom on the other side and I realized the charts looked identical, put them together, 45 to 50 year lag. Take 1961, which was the peak year of baby boom births before births turned down, and add 48, the average spending, that, gi that gives you a peak around late 2009. So it really is that simple. Baby boomers earn and spend more money till around late 2009, and then they slowly earn and spend less money, and the stock market simply follows that because it's not their savings and investment habits that drive the stock market, which some economists think. It's spending because spending drives the earnings of companies. The third problem is investments in medical and new technologies for medicine and other ways. That's partly contingent on having a lot of potential consumers. The projections for Western Europe are that the group 30 to 44 years of age is going to drop very significantly in size. When you have declining number of consumers at different ages, you discourage research and development productivity growth, which is the engine, fundamentally, the engine of growth in any economy. Why does that in particular matter? Because over the last century, it's people between the ages of 30 and 44 in all developed countries who've disproportionately been the innovators. It seems a strange thing with population growth so important to society that we never hear about that side of the story. Could it be that we are simply not comfortable with how that story unfolds? Young men are no longer motivated to marry and assume marital responsibilities for the sake of sexual gratification. This new period of life has not been as good for men. This is something that's readily available anyway. Men have a harder time growing up, I think, without women than women do without men. So if you're having a situation like in Europe where mm, people are marrying at a very, very late age, and I mean 30, 29 years old for men and women, we have many, many people in the age of 25, 30, even 35 and more who are staying with their parents and are not forming families. And I call them child men. Uh, they are gamers, you know, spending two hours, two plus hours a day playing video games. We have a lot of um, especially cohabiting relations. Reading um, uh, Maxim magazine uh, with all the silliness in there, watching cartoons on the Cartoon Network. The male has no um, plans for marriage with this particular person. It's simply uh, an arrangement of convenience. Well, of course, it has a huge impact on fertility because people are delaying their first child. They're delaying marriage and then they're delaying their first child. People need reasons to have children. Uh, 
they've known today and they've known for a long time how to avoid having children. Um, if there's no economic incentive to having children, um, people won't unless something other than economic incentive gives them uh, a reason. I don't think that the economic changes would have uh, had much impact and the absence of the value changes. So I think it's, uh, it's basically a matter of um, changes and attitudes, values, beliefs, um, characteristics of uh, the individual. The stock market from the beginning of 1990 to its bottom in 2003 went down 80%. Now these are blue chip stocks, the Nikkei. It's like the S&P 500 or the Dow here. We were some of the only people in the world to see this because we were looking at demographics. Everybody else was saying, oh, Japan's government doing this and then their companies are this productive and they have these management methods and their people save more and they work harder. Those were all symptoms. Demographics said, boom, and then bust, and yes, everything unraveled. Real estate, stocks, everything. Well, another act reaction a lot of people have when they first hear of these trends is to think that the young are going to benefit enormously because there'll be fewer of them. They'll, it'll, therefore, it'll be easier for them to find a job and to get a good wage. What I call the aging trap uh, is uh, the fact that the pyramid is in, inverted, and so you have a significant amount of older people over the young, pe young people, and therefore you cannot support the elderly. If you look at countries like Italy or Spain, where they're in the advanced throes of population aging, there's a theoretical demand for youth, but in the real world, uh, the youth unemployment rates in double digits. The aging trap is very serious for many reasons. One is because financially countries, and we see it today in Europe, in Asia, um, cannot be supported. Uh, the social services, especially in social market economies, this is uh, especially acute. The result is uh, the economy doesn't produce jobs. We are accustomed to financing retirement and health benefits for, for the elderly by taxes on the working population. Right now, the baby boom generation, the vast number of people born from 1946 through 1964, are in the workforce. They're paying into the system, helping fund the benefits that are being provided to the people who are already retired. But over the upcoming years, we're going to see that set of people move into the retirement phase. If these taxes go up because we have fewer people, we have to tax them each more, that's going to be a, a burden on the younger population, and they will adjust to that burden in a number of ways, partly maybe by investing less in their human capital, partly by maybe working less, and that will have further negative consequences. Social Security is only one part of the problem that we confront on the fiscal front. Medicare and Medicaid are a much bigger problem. Their growth is absolutely staggering under current law. Can we rethink our, our approach to retirement benefits, medical care of the elderly, and uh, adjust it to the world we will be in, which will be a world of stationary or declining population? The current generations, particularly those who are now retired and those who are approaching retirement, are not fulfilling their proper responsibilities towards future generations. Japan was a great leading indicator for developed countries and Western countries because they were the first to age because they didn't have the baby boom after World War II. 
When the United States, North America, Canada included, lesser degree, Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and most of Europe, slow, now you're talking 60-70% of the world economy, even though emerging countries are growing rapidly, we're still the majority of these Western countries. When we all slow, that is going to have a bigger impact on the world economy and it's going to hit emerging countries at first as well because emerging countries, and China's totally typical, 35-36% of its economy's exports. We think when the United States and Europe go into this uh, slowdown, particularly by 2010, due to demographics, that at first it's going to hit emerging countries and their stock markets are going to go down and their economy is going to slow. Now the difference is they will have the demographics to bounce back once they recover from that, whereas the United States and Europe will continue to slow and countries like Europe and Russia slow almost forever. Ну, естественно, что если все будет продолжать так, как продолжается, семья умрет и воспроизводство населения остановится со всеми прелестями, которые с этим связаны. Будет не будет браков, не будет детей. И ничего не будет. Вот. Но оптимисты говорят, ну и хорошо, вот будем на, на фабриках производить детей без э, участия мужчин и женщин, как говорится. Russia, to me, is a big problem waiting to happen. Because they've been a major military uh, power in the past. You still have a lot of access to that potential power, all that, that, that power has declined. But now they're going to go into an economic crisis. Russia's government is going to be dealing with a collapsing economy, uh, much greater falling taxes. На самом деле причины всего этого они более глубокие. Я пытался об этом немного сказать, и задача гораздо более тяжелая, чем вот как это воспринимают. Некоторые, даже многие, и как это воспринимает, к сожалению, наше правительство. One of the big changes in our culture, which is both a reflection and a cause of a lot of these things we've been talking about, is the fact that uh, in times past, people were far more concerned about and focused on children. 100 years ago or more, uh, 75 or 80 percent of all households had children. There they were, in the next room, growing up, and you thought about what was best for them. You organized your life around what was best for them. You allowed cultural messages in the home that was suitable for them. Today, we are down to around a third of households with children, two-thirds of households without children, and many of those, you know, permanently without children. I just think that has been a major force in shifting the focus of people's lives. Where I think uh, the bad news is about children is in the stability of their lives. One of the things that developmental psychologists tell us is that children thrive in stable and predictable relationships. The child thrives on the relationship between the parent, not necessarily on the relationship to father and mother, which are both good individually for the child, but what really causes the child to really thrive is when father and mother are really together. Most kids who grew up in a single mother household, I was raised by a single mother myself, most kids who are raised by a single mother or are raised in a step family, for instance, you know, turn out okay. That's, that's in fact true. At the same time though, and we have to be, I think, very honest about acknowledging this, kids who are raised outside of an intact married household are much more likely to experience problems. I've done a lot of work looking at trends in the U.S. Um, showing that kids who are reared outside of an intact, married family are more likely to suffer from things like poverty, child abuse, um, depression, delinquency, etc.
I think a social contract is a great metaphor for the relationship between adults and children in a society. Where I think things are uh, less happy is in the general sense that adults have an obligation to children generally. Definitely not fair for the children. And uh, I, I think that the children um, are not necessarily going to uh, come through with their part of the social contract either. When we have a divorce culture, and even a single, uh, overall, a more general single parent culture, what we are really saying is that the happiness of adults uh, is so much uh, more important than the well-being of children. I think that uh, in this uh, generation of uh, current young adults, there's a great deal of awareness that the older generations haven't done very well by them. The sexual revolution also has meant that um, it's it's not as um, it's not as socially stigmatized for um, women to have children while unmarried. It used to signal that they were having sex while they weren't married. Well, duh. Result of all this is that the percentage of out of wedlock births uh, grows and now is up to nearly 40%. Um, young women, women who, who find themselves pregnant, don't have a suitable spouse, have the baby anyway. Well, when so many children are born out of wedlock, they tend, not always, but they tend to not get as much parental investment and involvement in the very early stages. The family is a key for the generation of human capital, moral capital, and social capital. Now since learning begets learning, you start out with less learning there, and then you can't learn as much in, in, when you're three, four, five, six, seven. And when you don't have as much when you're seven, you, you can't learn as much when you're eight. Economies to register growth, to show growth, need three, these three elements, otherwise productivity, uh, the environment where the market operates and economic activities take place is uh, jeopardized. And in those formative periods, the family structure, all the studies suggest, is not the only factor you know, evolved, but it's, it's certainly important. So yes, those children born in those environments are at a significant disadvantage compared to children born in traditional two-parent caring families who spend a lot of time with them when they're young and by age six or seven they're way ahead of the other children. I have for some time been researching the idea of sustainable development and the family and my basic idea that you cannot have a sustainable development if you don't have a sustained family. This is where it gets weird though is who's reproducing, right? The problem is we have this is the, the demographic economic paradox. Those who can best sustain a large family are not having those large families. And those who can least sustain a large families tend to have more children. Income inequality is growing. And those with lower levels of income are those typically with less stable and less two-parent families, which exacerbates the disadvantage of those children. Over time, the, the range of disadvantage is growing and the degree of dispersion in our society for the, the children at the one end of the spectrum and the other is greater. You have a significant fraction of children, maybe 20, 25 percent of the children, who are not prepared to engage in the modern economy. They don't have the skills to do so, cognitive and non-cognitive. And the average child, even the average capable child, it's very difficult to overcome that disadvantage. And that's, I think, one of the major consequences of the family structure and this whole problem of learning begets learning and neglect at early ages is compounded at later ages. One of the questions, of course, is whether or not these same kinds of trends are applicable to Europe. Um, because particularly in Northern Europe, one of the big differences between um, Northern Europe and the United States is the generosity of the welfare state. The state makes much more investment in children, in daycare, in subsidies for mothers, and in many, all sorts of different ways tries to smooth the conflict between work and family that makes it very hard for 
many people to have the children that they want. What my research is, is indicating um, is that that's not the case. There certainly is less of an impact on poverty um, when marriage breaks down in Northern Europe. But on the other indicators, things like depression, delinquency, suicide, um, we see similar trends in countries like, for instance, Sweden. While these are surely unintended consequences, it begins to seem as if nothing will be spared by the storms of demographic winter. A lot of people I've talked to about this say, well, isn't, that, isn't it great if the birth rate is going down because after all, that's uh, fewer f carbon footprints and uh, less stress on, on Mother Earth. Uh, not thinking about uh, that they, how much their own care is going to cost when they get older. In the past, when people talk about the environment issues uh, due to human activities, they usually use uh, human population size or human population growth rate as a indicators of a human impact on the environment. This has to do with the fads and the way we frame our problems. And right now, the framing is very much about global warming and population density, sprawl, and that kind of thing. And I don't mean to say that those things don't matter, but that doesn't mean that other things don't matter and that we're not facing social and economic problems that are uh, also related, related to, to population decline. What we find um, uh, is that in globally, actually, the number of households has been increased much faster than number of people. Divorce creates more household. You would use more resources. And uh, in the meantime, you also create more greenhouse gases. If the uh, efficiency of resource use in divorced household is the same as married household, then in 2005 alone, US could save 73 billion kilowatt uh, hour of electricity and also can sell more than 600 billion gallons of water in 2005 alone in the United States. It turns out, however, there is academic hope for the demographic winter from recent findings about a very old institution. In 1990, the vast majority of academics in the social sciences held, not that the data held, but the people in the social sciences, professors, held that really family didn't make too much difference. The big issue was the income in the family. Uh, then the more you looked at the data, no, others were saying, no, the structure makes a difference. And what's behind the structure, which is the love, the belonging or the rejection, that makes a difference. That started an academic debate. And those who investigated, who were on the other side of the debate, actually, gradually, the really good number crunchers, the top social scientists, followed the data. And a decade to 15 years later, the verdict is in among the top academics. Marriage does make a difference. And the evidence is very strong. It's just as conclusive as social science evidence uh, ever is. All the evidence is, is very, very clear. It's married biological parents, which is the gold standard. Social scientists who are doing the numbers crunching uh, agree that uh, many of these recent changes have had some very negative consequences. Um, denying that is not going to solve the problems. Top researchers now know a couple of ironic reasons why it never needed to have happened, at least as widely as it has. I looked specifically at the people who said they were unhappy, and they were asked again, how happy are you with your marriage? And um, two-thirds of those people who were unhappy five years earlier who stayed married were either, um, this was a seven-point scale, seven being fabulous, were either a six or a seven. People with one partner are much happier with their partner sexually and emotionally than are individuals who have many partners. Correlational evidence as the associations are uh, striking. It may be too late.
For although economists and social scientists tell us that this is not a political issue, it remains perhaps the most highly politically incorrect one. There's a dispute, I think, between people who are making moral claims about family, divorce, cohabitation, gay marriage, all sorts of that. There's a dispute between people who are making moral claims about this and people who are making data-based claims. And when you look at uh, textbooks, when you look at um, what uh, scholars and academic people who are not doing the research uh, say about uh, this issue, there's a very big disconnect there. Those of us who are interested in data-based claims and are trying to steer clear of making clear moral claims about this, we're largely in agreement about the troubling waters that we're about to boat into. A lot of uh, the, the textbooks generally are not reporting very much of the evidence that's being accumulated by the researchers. It's also true, I think, for people who are worried about women's rights, about the gay rights, about environmentalism. All of these movements are deeply informed by a 1970s era preoccupation with the so-called population bomb. The people who are out there teaching, primarily in smaller colleges and universities, they, they really don't want to go into their classes and, and talk about um, uh, how uh, differences in uh, family form make a difference in terms of child outcomes. If suddenly we live in a world in which people understand that the future is one of de depopulation, then all of those progressive causes will have to find a new way of arguing. Interest groups that support families are very marginal um, in the political competition. And there's a good reason for this, I think, and that is that families are um, units that are looking after children. They're usually pretty busy um, and they don't have this the time or the inclination to compete on the political stage. This was a subcommittee of the Senate as I recall maybe eight or nine ten years ago and uh, at that time uh, many of us were calling attention to the fact that marriage was a seriously weakening institution in the United States. We were hoping that they might take some kind of action. Politicians will be bombarded by all sorts of groups. The temptation to forget that there are families out there and that the state and society in large has a role in supporting and protecting the family, that's, that's what is likely to get lost. I don't think anything came out of that, to tell you the truth. I have to admit that we started to pay serious attention to our family policy after we admitted that uh, we are facing the demographic catastrophe. The number of the young children are becoming less and less. And for such a small nation as Latvia, it might even endanger the, the survival of our nation. So it's very crucial for us uh, to change the demographic situation. And we, as the policymakers, think that the best way um, to improve the demographic situation is by strengthening the families. Well, one of the tricky things about this um, question is if people are not having enough children as a whole to replace the population, does that imply eventual human extinction? And I think the answer actually is no, because there are children still being born. It's just that they're disproportionately being born to people of faith. Um, that's true whether we're talking about Orthodox Jews or fundamentalist Christians. Um, fundamentalist 
<clears throat> Muslims um, around the world, uh, people of the book, uh, tend to have larger families than their secular counterparts. The evolutionary biology of sex is all about reproduction, which is sort of a mystery to me. If in fact we are hardwired to reproduce, why are so many people not interested in reproducing? For those of us who uh, were raised to believe in the teachings of Thomas Malthus or Charles Darwin, for example, these trends are very hard to absorb. I mean, the most intelligent people in the world are not interested in reproducing. Darwinism, for example, presumes that organisms always breed up to the limits of their resources. And this is what causes the, the, the competition and survival of the fittest under the theory. And yet here we look and we see there's one great big species that stands as an exception to this, apparently, and that one species would be human beings. They stake a lot on the idea that men are interested in reproducing themselves as much as possible, and men are interested in sex. And none of us doubt that, but are they really interested in reproducing themselves? Have they always been interested in that? I don't know, a lot of that's speculation. Um, the only way you can sort of preserve the theory is to say, well, human beings are on the road to extinction, they're maladapted to their environment, and, or you can say, as I just said previously, that certain kinds of human beings are on the way to extinction. In particular, um, people who, for lack of faith, don't go forth and multiply. We find ourselves at a crossroads. There's one way to turn this around, maybe. I'd call the Swedish model. That's one way. The other way is a return to traditional values, and specifically patriarchy, properly understood, um, which was a value system that the, at the end of the day um, persuaded both men and women not only to have children, but to take responsibility for them. There's not much you can say for the Swedish model um, that's encouraging. Swedish birth rate, despite these massive subsidies to parenthood, um, it's higher than in many other parts of Europe, but still not high enough to replace the population. When all is said and all is done, the demographic winter is really not about growing or shrinking populations. It's not about the economy. It's not even about the lifestyles of adults but rather history will show that it is ultimately about the children, what children will yet be born. It is they who will be consigned to wade through life's journey, burdened by the consequences of the demographic winter. I'm not quite a declinist as much as some people are, but uh, I guess I'm sort of a perpetual optimist about these things, but I must say it is hard to see how these things are going to be turned around. It's one of those paradoxes, I mean, uh, everything you look at life and the universe has cycles, and, and, and so does demographics, and so do countries and their development. You're going to gradually uh, have the weakening of the West. The Romans, in the time of Julius Caesar, were totally preoccupied by the fear that they were not producing enough children. The sterile uh, pagan nobility died out and with them their ancestors idea of Rome. You look back in history and no part of the world stays dominant forever. I mean, Rome was great and now they're, you know, Italy's doing well, but they're, they're nowhere near leading the world and Greece used to absolutely dominate innovation and philosophy and science.
Because countries, uh, as they get more prosperous and more urban, that's the two things you see with progress, particularly in modern time, people have fewer kids. So maybe the time of Western civilization has come and now we're going into a retreat. And it, if it helps, you know, just so you know where I'm coming from, I, you know, I'm not churched. I'm, I work for a progressive secular <laughs> think tank, right? And, and you can say this in your documentary in terms you're, of... You're saying that it's actually your own story. Oh, okay. Um, I have one child adopted. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a faith-based analysis. This is an analysis that, um, <laughs> may eventually bring me to faith, but uh, is, is not driven by faith. Um, it just turns out these were the facts take you when you look at population. <laughs>